Heavenly Father, we just uh, want to worship you and praise you tonight, Father. I pray that um, you give Brian the words to speak, the truth. Give him the wisdom, uh, guidance in, in that, uh, in his message that he proclaims tonight. That those that will hear will be blessed. Um, and those that aren't believers, Father, that their ears will be open to your truth that their hearts can be changed. We just thank you uh, for all that you've done for us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. What love could read Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, though are many, his mercy is more. What pain? would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins though are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins so are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy
Amen. Righteousness for me stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for me and stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood. Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Your cross testifies in grace, tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach, not by earthly confidence, it's only by your blood. Your cross testifies in grace, Tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach, not by earthly confidence. It's only by your blood. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of What can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. We praise you for the blood. Yeah, we praise you for the blood. Nothing but your blood. Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. We praise you for the blood. Yeah, we praise you for the blood. Nothing but your blood. Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Praise you for the blood. Yeah, we praise you for the blood. Nothing but your blood. Nothing but your blood, King Jesus.
purify this tainted soul. I'm tired of living life a fool. Soften up this hardened clay. To be a servant, this I pray. A reflection of you I long to be. So your kingdom I will seek. I surrender to your throne. Oh, I surrender to your throne. I will make my heart your home. Oh, I surrender to your throne. I've taken things I thought my own. Only to reap all I've sown. You've given back the years I fought. An ending love and grace you brought. Eternal hope and peace you bring. And forever unto you I will sing. I surrender to your throne. Oh, I surrender to your throne. And I will make my heart your home. Oh, I surrender to your throne. Forever unto you I will sing. Forever unto you I will sing forever unto you I will sing forever unto you I will sing and I surrender and I surrender and I surrender now and I surrender and I surrender and I surrender now and I surrender, and I surrender, and I surrender now. And I surrender, and I surrender, I surrender now. Softened up this heart and clay, to be a servant this I pray. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, open them with me to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 14 is where we're going to go to tonight. And I want to use this as a springboard, if you will, on the topic of repentance. And repentance is very similar to faith from the standpoint of it's commanded, but it's also granted given. So it's similar to faith from the standpoint of God commands us to have faith in Christ and he also grants the faith and gives the faith. And God commands all men everywhere to repent but he also grants repentance. And so you've got that balance again, that same balance that though we are and we should indeed repent, God supplies us with the ability to be able to repent in the same way as believed. So uh, so just a basic definition of what repentance is. Uh, repentance is the act whereby one turns from his or her sin. Idolatry, that's something we put in front of God. And creaturely rebellion, that's us by nature. And turns to God in faith and trust. Dependence, reliance, adherence is basically what that faith is. Now, throughout, throughout the Old and New Testament, we see God commanding people everywhere to repent. He commands the Israelites to repent. And uh, those who did repent were forgiven and received, and those who refused it were rejected and ultimately lost. 
But we go now to Hosea 14 and verse 1. And here we see God's heart cry to the people of Israel. And we believe, of course, that God's desire now is that all people repent, even those who won't. And so the cry here of the heart of God is return, O Israel. By the way, return is another word for repent. Return. It's a change of course. It's an about turn. In the same way backslide, the opposite of repent means is, is to turn back. But this is talking about return, coming back to God. So it's returning. Return, O Israel. And it's returning to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Now, Hosea, as we know, was married to a woman called Goma. And God actually commanded him to marry this woman. And he married Goma. And Goma was an example of Israel in her unfaithfulness and her adultery. And Hosea was told to go buy her back. And he did. He went and purchased her back and bought her back. And um, it was a picture of God's love for Israel. That even though Israel had sinned against him, and even though Israel had been unfaithful towards him, God remained faithful and called them back to himself. So in the book of Hosea, you have a picture, and I still believe there's a future picture that's not been fulfilled yet, which is talking about the future restoration of Israel, which will be fulfilled at the millennial age. Because there's promises given in chapter 14, which clearly speak of the millennial era when Israel will be restored. Now, obviously, we're not talking about all Israel, but we're talking about God's covenant confirmed to a remnant of these people that will be brought back. But in this, in this message tonight, we, we see God's heart in relation to repentance, that God's heart hasn't changed, that he still wishes that all would come to repentance. Now, 2 Peter 3.9 is the verse that we um, think about in the New Testament equivalent where we see God's nature and his inclination is that uh, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that all would come and all would, but that the wicked would repent and find mercy. And uh, there's, there's uh, statements in Ezekiel and throughout the Bible which clearly tells us God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn and repent. But um, 2 Peter 3, 9 here is, is an equivalent because we see that it's God's desire that all repent, even though all will not repent. And the reason why many will not repent is because we don't want to, basically. You know, we're, it's a reflection of our nature, who we are. And were it not for the grace of God, I don't think any human being would ever repent. Were it not for God granting it, no one would have it. But Second uh, Peter 3.9 tells us here, <clears throat> let's see, it says, uh, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, our long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance or come to repentance. That's a great evangelism verse because we clearly see that, hey, if anyone calls out to God in sincerity, you know, God will save that human being. All we can do is cry out. All we can do is call upon his name. We can't save ourselves. We call upon him to save us. And a genuine heartfelt cry will be answered and will be heard by him. All too often, the mechanics of this whole issue can get in the way in our thinking. Um, we shouldn't prevent anybody or even ourselves from 
seeking repentance. And, you know, we've had people, for example, even in this church, who have told us, well, we're waiting for this repentance, you know. We're waiting for this mystical feeling to come upon us, and then we'll repent. Well, the Bible clearly commands us to repent, so we don't need to wait for a feeling to repent, you know. And that's the other extreme, I think, of, you know, that, that would be the other heresy connected with this idea that we can just repent on our own. That's the other extreme. But we are to do what the Bible says. We, we, we don't seek mystical feelings and then repent. The Bible commands us to repent, so we should repent. And uh, now that we are believers, in particular, that foundation that of repentance has been laid. It's been fixed. There is a difference, for example, between the initial repentance that brought you into salvation. Now you're called to live an ongoing life of repentance. It ought to be easier. But how many, but, but how many of you find repentance easy? No? <laughs> Me neither. It's, it's almost like a Romans 7 experience, isn't it? There's a part of you that really wants to follow God, and then there's that sin nature that's still there that wants to hold on and still do its own thing. And every believer will struggle with that issue. Even those who claim they don't, they do. Don't believe them. They don't have something extra to what you have. They've got the same sin nature, the same problems. If the Apostle Paul struggled with Romans 7, you may rest assured that every believer will as well. So it, it's, it, it's tough as a, as a Christian, especially at the beginning, because God may grant you repentance on some sins, but as soon as you think you're doing good on, on some, he'll reveal others to you. Yeah. And, and it just it's an ongoing process. It's a never-ending. But, but in that whole process, he's conforming us in the image of the Son. Yeah. It just gets it, it gets better in ways that we may not see. Yeah. And in other ways it gets harder. <laughs> so yeah, we see how wicked we are and how, how holy he is. And God isn't surprised by that because he already knows what remains within us. And yeah. when we go through struggle, it's to expose to us yeah. what's in our heart because we may be completely ignorant. You know, I was told, and rightfully so, that when I became a believer I was given 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone be in Christ, and it's true, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. So I had the impression, no more problems. I'm going to be this new creation, and I'm just going to follow God all the time. I'm always going to say yes to God from here on in. And it didn't take too long to realize, no, it don't quite work that way. We battle with our old nature, and there are seasons when that old nature is more stronger at, at times than others. And the closer you get to God, the more you will realize your sin, not less so, but more so, because the closer you get to perfection, the more you will recognize the imperfections in you, which perhaps you didn't see before. But God's light shines on a true knowledge of God will bring a true knowledge of ourself. And uh, those two go hand in hand. And, and don't, don't get too depressed when you see yourself and you see aspects of who you are because we, we focus on the Lord. We're changed by the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're changed by worshiping Him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says we are being changed from glory to glory into the same image by the Spirit of the Lord. And, um, and that's true. But the good news is, when we seek repentance, is God wants us to repent. That, that's good news right there. So if you're seeking repentance tonight and you're struggling to get a hold of it and you're like, man, I want to repent, but why doesn't it seem to bear fruit in my life? Why do I confess my sin? Why do I repent? And I think that's the end of it. And all of a sudden, that same sin seems to rear its ugly head again. Well, take heart, because God wants you to persevere. There is such a thing called the perseverance of the saints. It is a valid 
It is a valid expression of the Christian life that we're called to persevere. And we gain comfort from the thought that God wants us to repent. He wants us to enjoy the full fruits of what that repentance is. And so as we seek him for it, we trust that he will also grant it. But So don't give up is what I'm saying tonight. If you've repented over a sin and that sin seems to keep coming back, you know, just persevere, trust the Lord, and he will not abandon you in your hour of failure, your hour of struggle. He's a merciful God. Don't forget that. And by the way, you're not saved by the perfection of your repentance, but you're saved by the perfection of the God that you are repenting to, right? And that's the beauty. Well, I think if we forget that his, his righteousness is accredited to us. Amen. Imputed to us. So Amen. even though we fail and fall, God still sees us as righteous because yes. of Christ's righteousness. That foundation is still intact, isn't it? It is. It, it should it, be. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reminded of the, of the passage <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where it talks about believers, you know, and being careful how you build on the foundation. And there is one believer that's described, and none of us want to be that believer, by the way, who he himself is saved, but everything that he did in life is all burned up, destroyed. Yet he himself is saved as passing through the fire. I mean, who wants to be that person? I mean, that person is still way better than the person who ends up in hell because they receive the righteousness of Christ. They have a crown of the righteousness of Jesus, which they... Received at the cross, Christ's finished work. But we want our lives to be used by God, don't we? We want God to use us, and we want God to work something through us that will last forever, and that will stand the test of time, and we want to live now for eternal purposes. And we want what we do now, even though it might be rejected by others now. You see, there are works that are rejected by man, that will be received by God for all eternity. And that's the reward that we're waiting for. So going back to this, Hosea 14, God's desire, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Now, as we go to verse 2, we also see that with Israel, not only did God desire that they repent, he told them what to say when they returned in repentance. He gave them the words of what to say when they repented, which is a clear sign that when God desires and commands repentance, because the return is also a command, he will give you what you need to be able to fulfill that command. So here... He's not only commanding them to repent, he's supplying them with the words they need to repent. Let's face it, guys, the problem with repentance is that human beings lack the ability to be able to do it. Not only do we lack the ability, we even many times lack the inclination to want to do it. <clears throat> but Romans 7, and the reason why I believe Paul wrote that second part as a believer is because as a believer, he says, the good I want to do, I don't seem to do, but rather the evil that is present with me. And so he's going through that conflict within himself. And then he reaches the point of great revelation, O oh, wretched man that I am, of hopelessness. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Praise be for our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, those principles often are at work in the life of the believer. But notice this, Hosea 14, 2. Take words with you. Okay, we would do that, Lord, but what should we say? Take words with you and return to the Lord. And he tells the Israelites, say to him, which I think is something we could say, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. <clears throat> notice that God is telling them to depend on the graciousness of God. Not on their ability to repent, 
He's even given them the words to say. And the beautiful thing about repentance is we can ask God, Lord, take away all iniquity. Now, here's a clue. You cannot take away your own iniquity. You need God to do it. Yeah, he doesn't say go and clean yourself up. No, and we've often tried that. It doesn't work too well. It's human inclination to want to do that too, that when we feel like we've messed up, it's like, okay. And not that it's wrong in the sense of, well, I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to do all these things more. And if you're doing it to clean yourself up in the wrong way, it's counterproductive and uh, it doesn't work too well. Let's not forget that the Bible says that whatsoever things does not proceed from faith is sin. Um, if you're doing that from faith, then that's good. But if you're doing it through trying to earn the cleansing that comes from God, then, um, you know, that's legalism then. So let God be the judge of our motivation and uh, examine our own heart to see if we're in the faith, right? So say to him, take away all iniquity so that you're relying on God. And uh, we don't deserve this, God. It's undeserved favor. So receive us graciously. It's an appeal to the grace of God. So the reason why Israel is going to get restored is by the grace of God. Thank God. The same way that you got restored, the grace of God. The same way that you got restored, they were forgiven of all their iniquities. It's not a different gospel, it's the same gospel, it's just a different, there will be a different time, a different season, but it's still the same gospel that saves. Amen? We don't change the message. So receive us graciously, because that's the only way that God can receive us, is graciously. What other appeal do we have? That we may present the fruit of our lips. Oh, Lord, if you receive us graciously, you will put fruit in our lips. And the fruitfulness of our lips will be true worship and true, and true praise. Because it's based on your graciousness that has received us. When you receive the grace of God, it will make a worshiper out of you. You will have every reason in the world to worship him. Because of his graciousness, that's the highest motivation to want to worship God, right? So, so after receiving his grace, then we will present the fruit of our lips. And it will be an acceptable fruit because it's on the basis of his grace that we praise, that we worship who he is. Now, with repentance, and this is really important, the next line here in verse 3. The one reason why people don't repent is because they're still trusting other avenues for possible salvation. I do think the recent times that our nation went through, and we can look up a lot of wicked political entities that went on, I don't see anywhere where the Christian ever should have trusted in politics to deliver them. It's an idol. It will fail you. And so the recent failures of our nation are a reminder to us that man will fail us. Political alliances will fail us. They always do. They always will. No matter what side you choose, they're going to use you for their own enterprise and when they're done with you, they'll drop you like a ton of bricks. That's the way the political entities work. And so if we are trusting in other avenues to save us, then it will lessen the purity of our repentance. Because repentance comes out of desperation. And the reality is only God can help us, period. There's no savior outside of him. There's no hope outside of him. And when Israel was brought to that point where all their political alliances had failed them, then, as my old Scottish pastor used to say, we are down to trusting in God. 
which should be the first thing we do. But it's often the last thing we do because we have these other trusts, which are idols. Political entities will not save us out of this mess. Only God will. And so we come in repentance. And we acknowledge that the form of things we trusted in will not save us. Assyria will not save us. And by the way, when we're trusting in other elements to save us, it will crush you. It will tear you apart. Because that's the nature of what idols do. Idols will fail you, no matter what that idol is. It will fail you. Only God will never fail you, but every other idol will. Assyria will not save us. And by the way, well, they didn't have cars back then. We will not ride on horses. No, nope, the strength and power of horses will not save us. Nor will we say again, our God to the work of our hands. So notice they were going for a cleansing here. They were going for a cleansing moment. Failure is a cleansing moment from God, a cleansing season. When all of our trusts have failed us, God purifies us, and we reach a point of repentance where we're delivered from our vanities, our deceptions. Why did we ever trust in Assyria? They, they won't save us. Egypt is a broken reed. We lean on it, it breaks. And the reason why we do that is because we want to do everything but repent. That's the last thing we want to do. We want to hold on to our pride, hold on to the illusions of who we think we are, and yet repentance reduces us to the reality that we are nothing apart from God. Nothing. Wretched out apart from God. So we won't say this to the works of our hands. Now, the next line is very important because you can't get more you can't get more needy than an orphan. An orphan has no coverage, no protection, no refuge. And so this is why Hosea is saying this. He's he's taking the most needy person in society at that point who is the orphan and he says for in you the orphan finds mercy and this could be uh, also a figure of speech too because when israel was taken out of the land they were like orphans yep. they had no place to live fatherless, no place to live fatherless amen oh so that's uh you see, we had, we had this fun hidden mandate to go New American Standard only. Yeah. And, and I did that tonight, and look at it. No. <laughs> I'm, we're, we're kidding, of course, uh, because it's good to compare translations because there's variants in it's Hebrew. It's a footnote. Footnote? In, in okay. the NAS. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's acceptable then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, for in you, the orphan finds mercy. Mercy. Cry out for mercy. Depend on mercy. The mercy of God. And those who cry out for mercy recognize that only God can help them. And that's why you cry out for mercy, by definition. The tax collector beat his breast and said, Be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee stood up and said, I'm not like other men. I do all these things. And I'm not like this guy down here. And the one who beat his breast said, Be merciful to me, a sinner. He was the one who went home justified, declared righteous by God, because he's relying on God's mercy to save him. But the Pharisee went home thinking he was pretty good. Well, real good, actually. And he had just wasted his time. I like the King James on that. It says he prayed with himself, basically. Now, Hosea 14, verse 4, this is one of my all-time favorite passages because Israel had failed. It had hit a point where 
Man, if it depended on Israel, there would never be an Israel again. But we understand this was even before Christ. And God made sure there was an Israel again. And God brought all the promises to pass. After 70 years, he brought them back into the land. And there were even people from the 10 tribes of Israel who came back into the land with Judah, with Jerusalem, in the period of Ezra and Nehemiah and Zechariah and Haggai. And by the way, there will be people again. It all, it's going to happen. Were it not for God's grace, were it not for God's grace, well, let me read a passage to you. Let's go to Romans here before I read this. And it's the one where it says, if God had not left us a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Destroyed. If I find ten righteous people, I will not destroy it. Remember that? Abraham interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, now, it's in Romans. The verse just came to me. But I try to obey if a verse comes to me because I feel like it's very important that we need to follow it. It's, I think it's in Romans um, 11, isn't it? Or is it 9? I get those two mixed up. It's actually a quotation from the book of Hosea, chapter 1. But Paul picks it up and uh, says, were it not for a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. See it in Romans 9 or Romans 11. Give me time here. Uh, let's see. It's uh, 9.29. Oh, thank you. Romans 9, 29. Well, let's read verse 27, because this is important. You see, if it, if it depended on man to come and repent, there would, no, there would be no Israel left. But he says, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. See that? So God already knows only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. Yep, judgment will happen. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, or not left us a seed, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. We would have ceased to exist as a nation, Paul says. But his hope, as he's writing these passages, is he's heartbroken for the people of Israel. He realizes God still has a plan. That's where he gets comfort from. And he knows God will still have a people, and there will be a millennium where all the promises of God that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to the rest of the fathers of Israel will be fulfilled. Every single one. Why? Because God is a faithful God. He's a covenant-keeping God. And God will always have an elect. And God's election will never be undone completely. He'll always have a people. So, let's go back to Hosea 14.4. And this is why I believe that there will be a restored people of Israel. This passage here. If I was looking at Israel, I said, no chance. It ain't going to happen. Look at them. If I was to look at our own life, no chance. It ain't going to happen. But notice this passage in verse 4, and this gives us hope. Now, I won't read all the other verses in Hosea, but if you read it in context, it's believed by faithful commentators that this passage is dealing with the future era of Christ's coming and the thousand-year reign from Jerusalem, and I believe that too. But let's read this. I will heal their backsliding. Oh, let's face it. Our biggest problem is backsliding. We backslide all the time. Backsliding is the opposite of repentance. It's a apostasy. Isn't and that's it? even worse. Well, it's, it's actually the, the note that I have. Yeah. 
says that um, the backslider was a term used by the Pharisees back in the day to uh, talk about the unbelievers. Yep. It's not somebody that was there and then was just walked away or failed. Mm -hmm. It was somebody that wasn't even actually a believer. Yeah. And I, I think that's where we use that term uh, wrongly uh, as a church, in a, in a sense. Well, the problem, though, is the, the Hebrew rendering has the word turn in it in the same way mm -hmm. that repentance does. And to backslide would be a need to, re, to return back to your first love. It, it, I know some people use backsliding as losing salvation and things like that. Um, but I think a true believer, you don't lose your salvation, but you have a tendency to lose your assurance at times, your joy, your peace, uh, you know, the, your first love. Obviously, the church in Ephesus had left their first love, and repentance was the cure to get back to it, wasn't it? Um, but the good news is, is that God says, I will heal it. In other words, you can't heal yourself. And, yeah, there's two different translations. Some translate it backsliding. Others translate it apostasy. I could read the de definition. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, recidivist, uh, regressor, apostate, defector, deserter, turncoat, renegade, or fallen angel. Or oh, wow. That's yeah. pretty severe, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. and when I when I understand, I, when I read it, I, I see it, it's somebody that's an unbeliever, not somebody that's yeah. that's come to true repentance and then just kind of... Although we're not saying that the true believer can't lose their first love and no, needs to I, repent. No, I agree. I agree yeah. with that. No, I agree. There is a difference between an apostate yeah. and someone who loses... It's term to justify their, their sinful ways. Yeah, sure. I, I hear you. Or other people's sinful ways. Yeah. So I will heal their backsliding or apostasy, and I will. I, I love the I wills here. I will love them... Freely. Now, on what basis does God love us freely? That's that word grace. The definition of grace is God loving us freely. Yeah. By grace, you have been saved, right? Through faith and not none of yourselves is the gift of God. We, the, what we looked at this morning. I will love them freely. I mean, let's face it, guys. If this depended on us, we would be very miserable, wouldn't we? Because it hits a point where you realize, man, if this depends on me, I'm in trouble. But God says, I will love them freely, which gives you hope. For my anger has turned away from him. Now, in our New Testament understanding, the anger of God was poured out on Jesus at the cross. That's why God's anger has turned away from us. Is because all of God's anger, all of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus at that cross. And for the believing sinner that comes, that wrath is lifted off of you because it was all placed on Christ. And so God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Now here's a word of exhortation or admonition. God's correction and God's discipline isn't his wrath. And you should be thankful that it isn't his wrath, right? Because his wrath will make a furrow end of us, but discipline and correction is a good thing. It's, it's a loving uh, demonstration of who he is. If you've had children, you understand that there has to be correction of some kind, because if there isn't, your kids would have ran amok. A fire was kindled in thine anger. Amen. <laughs> yeah. And maybe that's the problem, you know, um, yeah, so God does correct us, but the wrath of God. No, the believer is not appointed to obtain wrath, to receive wrath, but to obtain salvation. Why? Because the wrath was poured out on Jesus, and he drank every last cup of that wrath. Every last dreg was poured in himself and poured out on him so that you do not have to face the wrath of God, and neither do you need to fear facing it in the future there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But let me warn you, 
there will be plenty of correction <laughs> and plenty of discipline because he loves us. Um, so I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from him. So there we see a certain aspect of repentance being taught in these passages. Now let's go to Acts 5.31. I want to show you all the passages where it talks about God granting repentance. If God did not grant repentance, no human being could ever come to repentance because we would not be able to find it. We would not be able to get there. This is a merciful action of God on his part that he grants repentance. In other words, it, this may sound unreasonable to you, a first statement, but God would have every right to withhold repentance for, from us if he chose. Yeah. It's a fault. He's the offended party. When, when we've sinned, it's against God that we've sinned. And so him being God, he has the right to deal with that offense the way that he chooses. But that's how he demonstrates his mercy. Amen. By Amen. not. By not. Well, he shows his long suffering, doesn't he? In the fact that uh, even vessels that, that are prepared for destruction, he exercises great patience towards them in Romans 11. And, and um, one reason why some people try and make a claim, well, God don't exist, is because he tolerates evil. He puts up with evil. But the time is coming that will no longer be. And I think as we wind down into the, you know, I don't know if we're going to be alive with absolute certainty during the tribulation period or not. Some of you have already booked your ticket for the pre-trib one out of here. But either way, uh, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. But of course, there is a tribulation period that's coming. And that's prophesied extensively by the prophets and wherever you read of the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, it's not referring to a 24-hour period in that, in that context, unlike Genesis 1, which is. Um, it's referring to a time and a season when God's going to deal with people in a certain way. And so the day of the Lord is all the wrath that we read of in the book of Revelation. This has been prophesied extensively by the prophets. If you read the prophets, man, you will see that the day of the Lord mentioned repeatedly by these prophets. And if you're not careful, and if you temporarily forget about the cross, it's going to make you exceedingly miserable. Um, but it's going to happen, and God's wrath will be on display. It's on display now against sin, but it's not in fullness. And so people begin to think, well, where is God with all this evil going on? Well, he will show up more and more as time winds down, even to the point that people will be blaspheming him for the stuff that he pours out on the earth, but they will not come to him in repentance or give him glory. Some will, but the vast majority will despise and reject him because what's, it, what's exposed during that time is God's put the natural revelation of himself in every human being all along. And that will come out in times of pressure. And they, you know, they will hide. I mean, think about this. The atheists in the book of Revelation will say, will, will hide under the rocks and say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. How do they know about the wrath of the Lamb? Because they're seeing it happen and it, they're being exposed in... That atheism is being exposed for what it is. It's a deliberate self-deception on the part of human beings. It will be exposed because God has written the knowledge of himself in the heart of every human being to the point that we are without excuse. Read Revelation again and you will see that there will be people who will acknowledge that God's doing this, but they'll blaspheme him and not come to him. Why? Because that's rebellious human nature. Um, so let's go here to Acts 5, 31. All these words granting repentance or giving repentance. Now Acts 5, 31. Now some of Hosea's prophecy is being fulfilled in the gospel era too because God was giving repentance to Israel freely. 
giving repentance to Israel now. That God exalted him, that's Jesus, at his right hand, place of power, place of equal authority, God of very God, as leader and savior. Know this, why? To give repentance. So who gives repentance? Yep. And it's Jesus who gives it, right? He gives repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Now, when Jesus was in the flesh, weren't the scribes and Pharisees upset with him because he was forgiving sins even then? And they were right when they said, who can forgive sins but God? Well, here's the problem. Jesus was declaring himself to be God by forgiving sins. There's multiple places in Scripture that prove and show to us the deity of Jesus Christ. Forgiving sins is one of them. Because if he's just a first creature, as some cults claim, he would not have the power to forgive sins. But he does because he's God of very God, eternally begotten and not made. Um, to, to give repentance to Israel. Now, make no mistake, the gospel was preached to Israel first, remember? Even to Jerusalem, who had crucified their Savior, the gospel was proclaimed to those very people. Peter sent to the Sanhedrin, the ones who had voted against Jesus, who had conspired against him to crucify him. They heard the gospel. Is not God gracious? Caiaphas, on the day of judgment, he will be without excuse because he paid off the gods after they came to him and said, we saw an angel land on a rock and that rock was moved and the tomb was empty. And he bribed them. The Romans, and, he, and, and they said, now if this comes into the ear of, of, the, of your authority, we will appease them. And it means... We'll just give them money because, you know, a Roman soldier to breach his duty, that would be a death sentence usually. These people are without excuse. Caiaphas will give account to God on that final day and he will stand condemned because of what he knew and the way he operated against what he knew to be true. That will cry out against him. In fact, Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of God. And you know what? Caiaphas, you will see it. But unfortunately, you will not enter in because you rejected Jesus Christ, your Savior, your true high priest. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So forgiveness of sins, thank God. Now, Acts eleven eighteen. this is when... The gospel was granted to the Gentiles as well. And they were granted the same Holy Spirit that was given to them on the day of Pentecost. And they were amazed. Peter had to be really guided into preaching to the Gentiles, didn't he? Because he was a Jew and he didn't go into the house of a Gentile. And God was tearing down those barriers and making one body in Christ. And only the gospel has that kind of power. But Acts 11, 18, it says, When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance. Isn't that good news? That leads to life. Now think about this. They were in a place where if they had their way, they probably wouldn't have preached repentance to the Gentiles. But God granted it. And who were they to stand in the way of God, right? They acknowledged it and glorified it. Now, 2 Timothy 2.25, we are told, and reading this verse in context, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's encouraging and strengthening Timothy to address the false teachers in Ephesus at that time. And he's telling him how he is to conduct himself around this false teaching and around people who oppose the truth. And he's being told what 
fruit of the Spirit he is called to exemplify, right? In fact, let's read this, 2 Timothy 2, because I want to point out to you the fruit of the Spirit here. If you have the Holy Spirit in you as a believer, God wants to manifest and develop the fruit of the Spirit within you so that now when he uses you, he will use you and manifest that precious fruit of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 2, um, let's see here. Um, we'll, we'll start out, let's see, uh, verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind. Now, wait a minute. Kindness is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Don't we want the fruit of the Spirit to be manifest? Isn't it wonderful? Because what I've learned is I might be right about something biblically and theologically, but I'm wrong because of my immaturity in the way I might be expressing that via the fruit of the Spirit, a lack of the fruit of the Spirit, you know? But how much better to have the fruit of the Spirit as we express the truth of God's Word, right? That's, that's what we're called to do. So we're called to be kind. Well, I'll be kind to the people I like. No, it doesn't say that. Kind to everyone. Able to teach. Yep, that's important, that we have an ability to teach. But notice this, patiently, that's another fruit of the Spirit, by the way, enduring evil. Correcting his opponents, people who oppose the truth. With gentleness. Gentleness is the fruit of the Holy Spirit again. So, so far, we have, what, three Three of the fruits of the Spirit being mentioned in this passage. And trust me on this, there'll be plenty of opportunity for you and I to develop the fruit of the Spirit. And also plenty of opportunity to manifest the works of the flesh, which we don't want to do. Um, I think there's 16 of those, and there's nine... Nine of the fruit, but uh, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Now, this is why. God may perhaps grant them repentance. Isn't that good news? Isn't that always the hope? God may perhaps, I like the King James, peradventure. What a word. If peradventure, if perhaps, God may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Oh, what ministry that would be, right? If you and I could exemplify the fruit of the Spirit, let's cry out for that, that we learn to do that. So how do we know that God may grant repentance, right? Isn't that awesome? So we always minister with the prospect and hope of repentance. And even with people who might still reject truth of God, there's still a hope further down the line that the seed that was planted, someone else will water that seed. They might say the same thing that you were telling them, and they can't get away from it. Um, the old-time preachers had a word for it, the hound of heaven is hot on my trail. And that's what it feels like, because there's no escaping it. It's like, if you, if you reject the truth of God, you may rest assured there'll be someone else out there that presents to you the same truth, because God is presenting it to you with opportunity after opportunity to humble ourselves and say, I was wrong. You know, it's okay to admit you were wrong. It's all right. It's better to admit you're wrong than to pretend you weren't and just carry on as usual like nothing ever happened. And uh, that's pride when we do that. Admitting is repentance, isn't it? It is. It's a big part of it. Uh, it's, part of it it's a big part of it, Lance, yeah, because without admitting it, 
you, you could never repent of it, right? Um, Adam, when he was confronted for his sin, he got to say, the woman you gave me, you know? <laughs> and there's something in the fallenness of man. Yeah, we might have been sinned against. You know, I'm not saying we weren't. But after all is said and done, what we've done is what we need to repent of. We, we can't repent for what someone else has done. We can only repent for what we ourselves has done, right? Ezekiel cleared that up and when he said, a man will give account for his own sin, not the sin that his father has committed. We have no control over that. But we do have control over our own, right? In that sense of we are accountable for our own. We're accountable for one another in a sense that if we see one another sin, we... We encourage one another, we exalt one another, we desire to bring people back to truth. I understand that. But when it comes to repenting before God, you can only repent for your own sin. Right? You can't really repent for someone else's. Which is a good thing because I got enough of my own that I don't want to focus on John. You know? Praise God. So... Romans 2.4. Let's go to Romans 2.4. And I want to point out to you how repentance happens. That the kindness of God. Now the King James says the goodness of God. And the ESV New American translated the kindness of God. Now if you think of, of the kindness of God. God expresses his kindness. In not only not treating us how we deserve to be treated, but in giving us graciously, freely, his forgiveness. That's kindness, right? Paul warns them here, and we'll read verse 5 as well. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness? So now we're talking about the qualities of God, the attributes of who God is. The riches of his kindness. Have you considered tonight the riches of his kindness toward you personally? How he has not dealt with you as your sins have deserved, but he's been very kind to you. Isn't it wonderful? Just consider how good God has been to you. He hasn't dealt with you as your sins have deserved, but he's dealt with you on the basis of his only son. That's acceptable. Since, nice. since his grace that woke you up this morning because his judgment should have struck you dead last night. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what we call admonition, brother. That's good. <laughs> it is encouragement, but it's admonition as well. It's like be grateful for the day that we have, right? That we did wake up and we weren't condemned as we could have been. And... God righteously could have done. Um, but notice the attributes of God here. The riches of his kindness, that's first, and forbearance. When someone forbears with you, what would be the description of that? Tolerates. So does that mean, but when I irritate you, which I'm sure I do, rather than you react in a, you know what I mean, lack of patience, you learn to exercise tolerance. tolerance. Although that word is now redefined in our culture. It is. They're, they're taking our English words and they keep changing them, yeah, don't they? Yeah. Tolerance is you have to agree with me or I can't. No, that's not what it really means. Yeah. They confuse the two. They're yep. ignorant. Yeah, toleration is you disagree what someone's doing, but you still treat them with respect. You treat them well, and you don't treat them on the basis of what you don't like about them, but you... You tolerate in the sense of you hold back. Go ahead. I have a definition. It says the ability or willingness to tolerate something in particular, the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. That's good. I like that. Could you read that out again? Yeah. The ability or willingness to tolerate something, in particular, the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. So as Christians, we're going to have to be very forbearing in the times we're living in, aren't we? How are we going to preach the gospel to the people that we disagree with 
if, we, if we're not forbearing towards them. All this is done for the gospel's sake. This is where the political entities fail, you see, because if you're of a particular political persuasion and someone else is of another persuasion, you will not be exercising forbearance, I guarantee you that. So we can't do it on that basis. I've also got another note. In the Greek, it means to hold back. Ooh. was sometimes used uh, of a truce between warring parties. Rather than destroying every person, the moment uh, he or she sins, God graciously holds back his judgment. He saves sinners in a physical and temporal way from what they deserve. Yes. To show them his saving character, that they might come to him and receive salvation. Amen. That is spiritual and eternal. What, what some theologians call it, and I love this term, is common grace. Yep. That God doesn't treat people how they deserve to be treated, but he does the opposite. That's why, that's why the wicked often prosper in this life, and the wicked often do well in this life, is because of God's common grace. That's grace too. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, it's a good verse. And that seems like forbearance. Yeah, amen. That's right. One of the problems in the church sometimes is that we, we in our conscience might think something is a sin. I mean, there, there's things that are sin for everyone. Ten Commandments, for example. Um, but there could be gray areas like for you it might be a sin to have a glass of wine. That doesn't mean it's a sin for everyone, right? And um, yeah, so just use that as one of the examples. It's not a sin for me to eat bacon. I bring that up again, which you get tired of. But it is a sin for some people. And so, yeah, it really is. But there are gray areas, which are conscience areas, which we cannot make universal laws for every person. There are certain things that are conscience for ourselves that may not be a sin for somebody else, right? And that's what we have to forbear with, as you mentioned, Gloria, on those issues. I believe the word is adiaphron, is the word that, for your gray area, mm -hmm. that might be a sin for one person, but maybe not. Yeah, that's where you've got to exercise grace, forbearance to others. So... We move along here. Patience. It's translated long-suffering in the King James, which I like. Uh, Long-tempered. In other words, uh, similar to forbearance. Um, you have every right. God, of course, has every right to break out in wrath against us. But his long-suffering is exercised toward us because he's not wishing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. So that season of his grace is still extended but we must ask ourselves, how long will that season of grace be extended? Because when the day of the Lord starts happening, his grace is starting to be lifted. And his judgment is starting to come more to the forefront. A different aspect of his nature will be brought forth during those moments. Um, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. So God's kindness is the best motivation there is for repentance. It gives that true motivation to want to repent because God has been so kind and so good to us. But notice the opposite here, and this is often the heart and mindset of people who refuse repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are, notice that, you are storing up wrath for yourself. That's what you're doing because you're refusing to repent. You're storing up wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, it's going to happen. Nothing will escape the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Now, again, I, as I pointed out to you just in passing, there's two different judgments. There's a judgment for the believer and a judgment for the unbeliever. And um, the judgment for the unbeliever, their names are not found in the Lamb's Book of Life. They'll be cast into the lake of fire. 
Hell will give up its dead. There'll be a resurrection of the unjust as well as the just, and they'll give account. Books will be opened, and it will be a fair judgment. It will not be unfair. It will be absolutely fair. And no one, every mouth will be stopped. And, you know, that's going to be quite, quite an event. That's why we share the gospel with others. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 7, 8, 9 is another thing that brings repentance says so uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and obviously he was upset with them. If you remember, there was a man who was sleeping with his own stepmother, and the Corinthian church was acting like, oh, no big deal, you know. And Paul had to write to them a severe letter. And it brought great grief to them. And uh, it says, but even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it. Yeah. He didn't, he, at the point, as, as a fellow human being, he had regretted it because he saw the sorrow that his letter had caused. He says, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. Isn't that good news? Godly sorrow is another aspect that works repentance. Sometimes we grieve the Holy Spirit, don't we? And we sense that we've grieved him by our life and actions, and it does produce a desire to want to change, to want to do better, because we don't want to grieve the God who we love the most. Um, but because you are grieved into repentance, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. He says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret afterwards, right? Uh, this is correction. This would be correct, the correction that we're talking about. Uh, whereas worldly grief produces death. I'll give you one example quickly of someone who had worldly grief. Judas Iscariot. He threw the money into the temple. I sinned against an innocent man. What did he do? Went out and hung himself. That was worldly grief that produced death, not, not repentance. Now, Acts 17.30, God also commands repentance. Now, like I said this morning, I've had people tell me, well, God would be unfair and God will be unjust if he commands something that we can't do. Well, you understand my response to that. Well, take away the whole Ten Commandments. Take away every commandment of the law then. If you're going to use that as a measuring stick of something that's just or unjust, just because we can't do what we should do doesn't make God's command wrong. And so when God commands repentance... When I find in myself an inability to do it, then I make that wonderful discovery that God grants it. That's grace. So He uses those things like the law to show us our need of Him. Yeah. Not that we can do it on our own. That's right. I remember Pilgrim's Progress, that yep. that uh, animated movie that we watched, where he's trying to get to the top of the mountain. And as he's trying to get to the top, all these commands are coming up. You did this wrong. You failed. You did this wrong. He's trying to make it up there. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Till finally he gives up and wrath is all over him. And evangelist shows up and delivers him from that issue and gives him the gospel again. Yep. Which I think is what we need. But thank God for the law because the law whips us, disciplines us. And brings us to that point where we realize, God, I can't do this on my own. I need the gospel. I need your mercy. I need your grace. The law is a tutor. The King James says schoolmaster, but tutor to bring us to Christ. Thank God for it. So when God commands repentance and we seek to obey that command, and then we find that we can't do it, what that shows us is this, you know, that's like the law hitting us. You can't do it. You need grace. And then you receive his grace afterwards. But let's look at this. The times of ignorance got overlooked, but now 
And we're living in these days now, by the way. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Everywhere. Rock Springs, Wyoming covers this. This is applicable to this town right here. God commands it. Now, this is why, and we'll, this will be the final verse that we look at, and we can open it up. Because he has fixed a day. It's already set in his calendar, by the way. He has fixed a day. In other words, that's not going to be changed. It's set. It's been preset by God. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. It's an appointment set up by his equation. That's why it's fixed. You don't have to change it because God don't make mistakes. There's no unforeseen things. You know, I've made appointments before and I've had to change them because I've double booked myself. How about you? But this says he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. All perfect righteousness here. By a man, that's Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed. God the Father has appointed him. And of this he has given assurance to all. God the Father has. By raising him, the man who will be the judge from the dead. Isn't that awesome? Amazing thought. I've got a, a, the NASB. It says, uh, a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men, by raising him from the dead. Furnished proof. I like that. That's very good. So guys, be encouraged tonight. I know some of us are going through battles here. Well, we all are, but some worse than others. And struggling with your own self. And um, you're not alone in this struggle. You've got other believers around you. But more importantly, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. That can help you with these battles that you have with your old nature. And... Uh, you know, a oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the answer. So we'll close here, guys. But any thoughts, anything you want to add to what we've been looking at? I've got a note from um, Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 2 on repentance. Yeah. It says, uh, this is no mere academic change of mind, mm -hmm. nor mere regret or remorse. John the Baptist spoke, spoke of repentance as a radical turning from sin that is inevitably become manifest in the fruit of righteousness. Jesus' first sermon began with the same imperative for this discussion of the nature of repentance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. That I was, like that. Uh, Matthew 4, 17. Amen. Amen. It's important, isn't it? That, well, the, the reference to, to Jesus uh, was Matthew 4, 17. This is from the time Jesus began to preach. He said, repent for this kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. I like Mark 1, 15, where he says, repent and believe yeah, the absolutely. gospel, um, the good news of the kingdom. Um, it's not changed. It's still repent and believe, isn't it? It's not changed one iota. Um, it's incredible. Anything else before we wrap up? Which comes first, the believe or the repent? No, <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think it it happens together. I'd say, right? I, I know we as humans we want to separate and analyze it and study it, but when you look back at your salvation experience, it was all happened so quickly. It well, was I think incredible. the command is repent, turn away from your sins, mm -hmm. forsake them, turn away from them, and trust that Christ's sacrifice was enough to cover them. I think yeah. that's kind of the the context that he's trying to get at. On yeah, I don't think there's really a they're getting at an order of belief or, and repentance. Well, what I learned is a process because yeah. when I was convicted of sin, I was trying to change. And this is before salvation. And I found an inability within myself to genuinely repent because I didn't love the God I was trying to repent to because I wasn't saved. I wasn't born again yet. But when he poured his love in my heart, I repented for the first time in my life willingly gladly and doing good things for the right reason not just to try to rescue me from potential hell which you know 
I which is a, important. A good analogy on repentance as well is when, when a husband commits adultery on his wife and he comes to her, she calls him out on it, and he, oh, okay, I, I won't do it anymore. You know, and he admits it. He says, oh, yeah, I won't do it anymore. Does that is that enough? And then he's no. going to go, he, he does it again, right? Yeah. He has to have remorse for that sin. He has to turn away from that sin. Yeah. Confess it to her, turn away, forsake it, and ask her to forgive him. Yeah. You know, that's true reconciliation. That's true repentance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to just say, oh, forgive me for that, I'm sorry, and then go do it again. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, some sins will cling to you, and, uh, Sexual sins will cling to you. We know that. And but 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 for the grace of God, there go we. You know, yep. um, only by God's grace can those sins be broken from our life. Any sin, actually. Um, so, well, guys, we will we'll close close in prayer, shall we? Then I think we I think we're done this evening. Gloria, would you mind closing in prayer? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight and thank you for this sermon on repentance. I pray that we would all have a repentant heart from the things that um, yes, daily occur with us so that we could walk with you uh, rejoicing all the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.